So for the final session of the evening, uh, Dr. Patricia Hall and Rosanna, Dr. Rosanna Sanchez Russo are speaking. Dr. Hall is the Operations and Scientific Director for the Chemical Genetics Laboratory at EGL Eurofins, and Dr. Russo is Assistant Professor at Emory University Department of Human Genetics in Atlanta. They together will present implementation of newborn screening for Pompeii and MPS1 in Georgia. Thank you very much. Um, I already used up my joke, so we can just start. Um, <laughs> I'm here to talk to you about the laboratory parts of our newborn screening. Um, as the introduction, I'm going to talk to you about the laboratory aspects of the screening that we've been doing for Pompeii and MPS1, and Dr. Sanchez will pick up with the clinical follow-up for our kids. Um, Basically, George has been a site for some of the NIH-funded pilot studies. We've completed Pompeii disease, MPS1, and X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. We're planning to start spinal muscular atrophy as of, I think, our tentative date is September, but that one's not on me, so I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, basically, we screened, uh, thank you. Uh, we screened starting in early 2017, um, late 2016 for Pompeii and MPS1. We did those simultaneously. We did X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy as a standalone, and then um, we will continue with spinal muscular atrophy moving forward. Um, this went through about six iterations of how we were going to do the screening initially. Um, basically, what we were planning to do was to screen primarily with the baby's fluorometric assay, which then got caught up in a lot of FDA wrangling, which meant having it through the system that we wanted to screen with a lab developed test and no consent was not going to be feasible. So we switched gears and we did uh, two-tier testing with both, um, both steps by mass spec. Um, uh, so our first tier test was, was a tuplex enzyme assay, which basically was just pump A and MPS1 measurement. And then in an attempt to reduce false positives before we reported anything out, we switched and we did a, six, a sixplex enzyme assay on the um, same dried, dried blood spot before we bothered to um, call the patient, patient in for additional testing. Um, basically, the tandem mass spec assay has been really well described. You have a substrate and an internal standard that are specific for the enzyme you're measuring. And if you have lots of product, your enzyme activity is normal. Decreased enzyme activity gives you small amounts of product. Our workflow here, basically, samples started at the Georgia Public Health Lab where we did all of the other testing. The samples came to EGL Genetics. Um, they were married up with demographic data from the Emory follow-up database. And we then did the screening and interpretation. So if everything was normal on the first tier tuplex test, oh, they, went to, they went straight into the Emory follow-up database as normal. If they were abnormal on the first tier test, they went back to the state public health lab. We punched another sample, and we did the sixplex. And if they were abnormal on the second tier test, they were reported out. So if the first tier was abnormal, then we did not request another sample unless it was QNS, but typically, I don't think we had to request an additional sample for QNS just for mass spec. If our sample for, ma for the enzyme assay was QNS, it was probably already, it was usually already QNS earlier in the process. So this two-tier strategy of a lower specificity first-tier test with a higher specificity second-tier test has been kind of used additionally in newborn screening. Um, second-tier steroid profiling for CAH to reduce false positives has been done quite a lot and also the branched chain amino acids and aloisoleucine for MSUD. So our interpretation was all done with post-analytical tools through CLEAR. Um, primarily, we did the tuplex that was adjusted for the agent collection. Um, secondary, we did tuplex that was unadjusted for agent collection. Um, we typically only use this if we didn't have an agent collection or for the extremes. So typically, anybody who you often have samples collected on critically ill infants around one hour of age or on very old infants and the adjustments on the extremes aren't as good, so we used an unadjusted tool at that point. Um, the tuplex tools were specifically made for Georgia, um, but if anybody wanted to use them, they're definitely available and well populated. So just as an example of an MPS1 abnormal, uh, basically uh, the measured IDUA enzyme activity was 0.2 nanomoles per hour per mil. 
Um, the first percentile of the normal range in clear was 3.16, so this was almost as close to undetectable as we could get to. The sample was collected at 32 hours. The term baby um, with nothing particularly concerning on any of his other newborn screens. Um, the single condition tool on the tuplex basically said this is likely MPS1. Um, and if you're used to at all looking at um, post analytical tools, the red bars, okay, you can see them pretty well. The red bars are the disease range for the condition, um, and the red diamonds are the values for our case. Green bars, they kind of look a bit gray. Um, those are the reference range for any given um, analyte as well. Um, and then, if you're sitting over here, you're not gonna be able to see this, but there is a dual scatter plot. Basically, you're plotting false positives against confirmed true positives to see which one your case looks more like. Um, in this case, it looks very much like a true positive. Um, spoiler alert, it was not. The MPS1 pseudo deficiencies are very hard to tease out biochemically by enzyme analysis from your true positives. Um, we certainly can't measure an enzyme much lower than 0.2, and I don't think you could set a cutoff with the normal range that we had anywhere that wouldn't say a 0.2 was abnormal. So I think this is just something that has to be adjusted with probably other second tier screening methods for MPS1. Final screening results, we screened 59,332 samples. Um, first tier screening results, what we called kind of analytical repeats were failures, sample losses that we referred to the second tier test so that we could resolve them conclusively in as timely a manner as possible. Every single one of these was normal by the second tier test. Um, 310 samples screened positive for Pomp A disease by the first tier test. 17 screened positive by the first tier test for MPS1 alone. Um, second tier screening results, um, we cut down a lot of this for Pomp A disease. Basically, Pomp A disease was very noisy around the bottom end of the reference range, but truly affected cases stood out nicely. Um, we reported out six screens as positive. Two of these were on one infant. Um, three were true positive, which was four true positive screens for a positive predictive value of 67%, which we were very happy with. Um, MPS1, we reported out 11 as positives. Um, we have no true positives in that population to date, so our positive predictive value for those is 0%. Um, as we said, our screening strategy of tuplex to sixplex worked great for Pomp A, but really not for MPS1. So uh, the screen positives really were teased out well in Pomp A disease by the addition of the uh, additional enzymes. Basically, the, there was a lot of mild reductions in Pomp A disease that get you below your reference range but probably kind of into that gap that you really like to see with an enzyme assay between the bottom of your normal range and the top of your affected range. Uh, whereas for MPS1, what we're presuming are pseudo deficiencies really knock the enzyme activity down to be almost undetectable. Um, we're probably, if, when we're thinking about how we're gonna screen for this moving forward, um, I think one of the things we're likely to try is measuring dermatin and heparin sulfate in dried blood spots. It seems to have some promise as a second tier test that's been done at Mayo. Um, we haven't explored the molecular pathways, but that's um, definitely something that we need to keep in mind because with our population, this would have been about half a year of screening. It wouldn't be our worst performing test from a positive predictive value standpoint, but it certainly wouldn't be our best either. So we were really happy with the performance for Pomp A disease but um, we do think we need some tweaking to do when we look at MPS1. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rosanna. So I'll be uh, speaking about the, the outcomes and the results on these cases that were positive. So taking off where um, Dr. Hall left off, uh, the first red mark, we have the tuplex enzyme assay. And as she said, we had the 59,332 uh, um, screens. Then of those for Pompeii disease specifically, we had 310 that were abnormal and went to the sixplex enzyme assay. From these six were abnormal, and this is where we would come in for the confirmatory testing. And so at this stage, what we would do is two sets of testing. One was done locally through the pediatrician's office, and it included an EKG and a CPK, um, as well as the chest x-ray looking for signs of cardiomyopathy and muscle involvement. And then through the actual pilot program, and this was performed by Duke University, we had the extramolecular and biochemical um, biomarkers. 
So we had the GAA enzyme activity, a urine biomarker called urine hex 4, which is a, which is a tetrasaccharide, um, molecular testing, both sequencing and uh, deletion duplication analysis. And for um, select cases, we would do CRIM status if needed. And so of these um, six screens, there were on five different patients because one had a repeat sample done because it was collected before 24 hours of life. And so what we saw is that we could confirm that we had an infantile onset Pompe disease case who was successfully started on enzyme replacement therapy. We had two presumed late onset Pompe disease cases, one pseudo deficiency, and then one patient that was lost to follow up, and I'll go over some of these details. This left us in our current pilot program with a combined <coughs> incidence of one in 20,000. Um, the estimated uh, incidence in the U.S. right now is one in 40,000, but this really is different by states and um, by ethnicities in each state. So ours is closer to the African-American population, which is one in 14,000, which goes with um, what we found in our results. And so here are those um, six positive screens in five cases. So you'll see that we have case 1A and 1B, which was that patient who had the repeat screen. Um, this patient was a full-term baby boy who had some respiratory distress after birth, had a chest x-ray done at that time, which was completely normal, was discharged home, had the first screening done before 24 hours of life. So at that point, a repeat screen uh, was suggested. When the second one was abnormal, that's when the confirmatory testing was undertaken. At that point, um, the CPK was elevated close to 600, and there were changes on the EKG with a short PR interval and, and signs of left ventricular hypertrophy. So he was brought into the hospital for uh, further care. We did an echocardiogram, which did show the cardiomyopathy, and we collected the rest of the confirmatory testing. The urine hex 4 uh, was borderline, so the cutoff is 20, the baby's was 20.2. And we were able to obtain a DNA analysis, and what we found was two pathogenic variants which were confirmed to be in trans, one for which we knew the CRIM status was positive. Mm -hmm. And this is the cross-reactive immunological material in babies who have basically no enzyme activity left. And the CRIM, if that, um, we say they're CRIM negative, they go through immunomodulation. So this baby did not go through immunomodulation, but he has had some uh, transfusion, react, uh, tra transfusion um, reactions to the enzyme replacement therapy. And so what we have done now is a uh, desensitization protocol for him. Now of note, this is a 14 month old now, and he is walking, he is reaching all his milestones and can say four words at this point. So this is right now a success story for us. The next two patients are um, case two and three who are the patients who are presumed to be late onset cases. Basically, the workup was normal, except for uh, the molecular testing in one of those cases. We found two mild pathogenic variants in trans. In the other one, we found a variant of unknown significance in trans with a milder variant. So both of these children who are now above one year of age, it is a struggle because we're just doing long-term follow-up on them. We can't predict even when they're gonna have any symptoms or when we're gonna um, start enzyme replacement therapy for them. The thought right now is that we'll um, do it either if symptoms arise or any biomarkers become abnormal. So we're following them up clinically and doing the urine hex force and the CPKs for them. The next case is an unresolved case. It was a, a family from, I believe it was Nigeria, who moved back, so we couldn't even report it out to the family. And the last one, um, they were from Asian descent, and we confirmed that had actual, actually two homozygous pseudo-deficiency alleles, um, which apparently is in 4% of all Asians. And uh, so we were not following up that case. For MPS1, as Dr. Hall already mentioned, the story was very different. Of all of the positive cases at the six-plex six stage, we have not been able to confirm any and I'll go through the breakdown of those cases. Um, what we performed as confirmatory testing was the urine gags, the IDUA enzyme activity, and then the molecular, we did also the sequencing and deletion duplication analysis for the IDUA gene. And so of these cases, we have three unresolved that we're now monitoring. We have two pseudo deficiencies confirmed that we have discharged from clinic. 
we have three unaffected after we perform the follow-up enzyme analysis, and we have three families who just refused follow-up. And so of, of the first three cases, these are the ones that we're following up, um, they're all of African-American descent. They all had you know, low enzyme activities when we did the follow-up. The urine glycosaminoglycans, some of them for case number two, were a little bit elevated, but if you look at the reports and you talk to the biochemical labs, they were not significantly concerning. And when we did the uh, DNA analysis, the first two cases had only one boost. We couldn't find any other changes in the second allele, and the deletion duplication analysis was negative. So as was talked about before in the, um, in the exome sequencing for newborn screening, we can't say there's not a deep intronic variant or something else there. So we're following these cases clinically. The third case is even harder because we found no changes at all in the sequencing or deletion duplication analysis. Um, so this family actually did very well with the information despite us telling them we really don't know what's going on, we don't know if he's gonna have any symptoms and right now all the biomarkers are normal and we're following these patients in the clinic. Um, the fourth and fifth case are our pseudodeficiencies. Six, seven, and eight, if you look at the um, highlighted numbers, those are the enzymes that after we did confirmatory enzyme, they're actually normal. And the last three are the families who refused follow-up. Um, since this was a pilot screening, we did not get any authorities involved, so we didn't call the uh, child protective protective teams or any others as we do if it's one of the established diseases. Um, and so the strength, we, we were able to show that we could do the screening basically. It was feasible that the uh, burden for false positives was not bad even for us in the clinic. We would be able to look at, at all of these kids and follow them up. Uh, definitely there was a higher false positive rate for MPS1 than Pompe disease. Um, there was also successful implementation of the post-analytical tools, of those, as Dr. Hall already mentioned. And we had a, a good um, implementation of the protocol for confirmatory testing, but we had a lot of problems with um, getting the molecular testing done for MPS1. Because for Pompeii disease, it was streamlined through Duke University through our pilot program, but this was not the case um, for MPS1 it would go through the regular channels of insurance, and we had a lot of problems obtaining um, some of these results. Um, the good thing about it, though, is that for the cases like the IOPD, um, we were able to get them into clinic in a timely manner and start enzyme replacement therapy, so that baby was started on ERT when he was 12 weeks of life. Hopefully, as we streamline our protocol better, if this is implemented in the state, we can even shorten that time period. Um, weaknesses, as you saw, the samples had to go from the Georgia Public Health Lab to the Emory Genetics Lab, uh, Eurofins Lab, and so there was a time offset between the samples, and then if it was positive, we needed another punch. And then the other problem, since this was a pilot, was that the results wouldn't come in the same um, official state lab report. And so we did have a little bit of trouble with the pediatricians to understand that this was a pilot program and what was expected from it. We would receive a lot of calls stating, oh, the patient has MPS1 and Pompe disease, and we're like, no, no, we're just letting you guys know that we're screening for these conditions. Um, and then at this point, we um, don't know about the false negative rate, but we haven't had any calls or any children that we've heard or known about that have any symptoms that are concerning that we may have missed, um, being the biggest center we would expect to know, but that can't be a certain. Um, and then as I mentioned, there was difficulty in obtaining some of the molecular testing more than the biochemical testing. Implications for families, for a lot of families, did, this did cause a lot of anxiety. And this is a, a well understood, because the phenotypes were sometimes uncertain. We couldn't tell if this was a late onset case or not. We didn't know how long they were gonna remain asymptomatic or when and if we were gonna um, give them treatment. So this was even more pronounced for MPS1 than for Pompe disease. And then families had a hard time distinguishing a pilot program from an actual research study. 
Sometimes they thought that they were participating in something different than they actually were, and we had a way of informed consent actually for this. Um, and then the families who refused follow up refused it despite several calls to them, explaining that this may change the outcomes if the patients were deemed to be true positives and that there were expectations that we could give some sort of treatment for them. And then lastly, for policy uh, makers, well, we did see overall few false positives, but we have to take into account the specifics also of our population. So around 40% of the residents of Georgia are African American, so there's an expected higher rate of pseudo deficiency here, um, which may or may not be clarified by molecular testing. There was also a high percentage of low birth weights and premature infants for the state, but this did not seem to burden significantly actually this uh, screening for MPS1 or Pompeii disease. And then I think the biggest one is what are we gonna do about the long-term care um, for the follow-up of these kids who are thought to have the later onset um, diseases. And thank you to all the pilot study teams, the biochemical genetics lab at Mayo, um, and the patients and the families. Any questions? And that clicker was not Trisha, it was going by itself. <laughs> So this is a pilot study, right? Yes. Okay. So on basis of the pilot study, have you, do you go back and make alterations in the, in the way this could be rolled out, or in other words, or not? So it appears to be three problems. One is the late onset, two yes. is the, uh, the ability to diagnose MPS, and three, the most yes. important is you've got a problem with insurance getting this done yes. efficiently. So are you going to make any changes to newborn screening as a result of this pilot? Yeah, we, we think so. I mean, there was, there's a concern first that maybe we won't do the testing through Eurofins, but it would be done locally at the Georgia Public Health Lab. So there may be a need to change, actually, first the technology. So babies is one of the things that we were looking at. Uh, so actually the whole process may change in that regard. Yeah. Um, for the follow-ups, for the clinical part, I think we have to take on the burden um, of following these kids and trying to get um, insurance to pay as yeah, deemed right. medically necessary by us, well, both molecular and biochemical testing. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm on a task force for Florida. We have to make a decision on, yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so when we uh, made the, when we made the, um, I'm on the Georgia State Advisory Committee. And so when we, uh, both, all three of Pompeii, MPS1, and XALD were nominated and recommended for inclusion with the caveats that it include the funding for the testing and all of the follow-up, including molecular, as part of that condition being added, as opposed to attempting to catch it with insurance. So that was in the caveat that we we recommended it to include follow-up testing, which we haven't done before. And that recommendation was accepted, so all three have been accepted with the provision for additional funding. So you had to, so it is accepted that, that yes, they're going to, all three. So now, we're on the task force in Florida. Do you have any recommendations? We're actually deciding within the next couple of months. Do you have any recommendations for us as we go forward? So we basically, um, our process is, it comes to our state advisory yeah, committee, so, do all that. Right. Um, we then make a recommendation to our public yeah, same health as ours. Okay, perfect. But do you have any recommendation in terms of now from your experience, uh, sort of caveats or advice in terms of what we need to? Uh, definitely to include all of the follow-up testing because that was kind of our major stumbling block and also that the testing for the screening and follow-up is all included in that recommendation. We rolled all those up. Yeah, so you've asked money for follow-up too? Yes. For the clinical follow-up? Yes. Uh, clinical follow-up, well not the clinical follow-up. Um, Why not? Um, that's generally kind of always been beyond once they're identified as a patient. We no, I mean for the, the, the actual process of counseling. And oh, for identification of the patient. Confirmation. Screening, yeah, confirmation. Screening. Yeah, confirmation. To the point that they are referred to clinic, that yeah. is included in our request for funding. Their clinical care is yeah, so not, not, the right, long yeah, term, right. not the long term follow up. Right, of course, yes, yes. Thank you. Us. But we haven't had a lot of problems with the biochemicals, mostly the molecular, where we kind of fell short. Um, with the Georgia Medicaid, they do have a contract through EGL Genetics, 
So if they offer the genes, it's very easy for us to send it through them. The problem is more right now with private insurances or if they don't offer that specific gene. I was just going to comment that um, there's more free testing being offered for MPS, although some of the current testing projects, newborn screening wouldn't be covered. There's more molecular testing coming down the road that probably will cover some of that too. So if there's a state that doesn't have the ability to put it in like Georgia did, there's always options for that. Like what? Coming soon. Like what? What options are you talking about? Molecular testing for diagnosis. No, no, but what, what resources are you specifically thinking? There are um, sponsored testing programs by the pharmaceutical companies. And they tend to be for all MPSs, not just a single MPS. But it does give some flexibility as we're going forward. Um, again, it's better if you can do what happened here with the Georgia one where you get it included in there. But if you can't, there are at least options coming up. I would say for Florida, if, they didn't, if there was no funding available for testing and we're going to be in limbo with these patients, I would refuse to, I mean, I would, my, I would not recommend it. Uh, you know, there is that possibility with um, companies, but that's dependent on their, their welfare. That was pretty much how ours was, was yeah. the only recommendation we made was add it with all of the funding. It wasn't add it and we'd really like funding. It was if you add it, we need this which it pushes our timeline back for actually getting it added, but they did actually make that provision when they approved it. Any other questions? <laughs>